Welcome back. Hello, everyone. I'm your friend in Excel. So today we're going to know the transformations of functions. As far as I think, it's probably just a, a, a bunch of video where he was talking about uh, how can you change the function parameters to change the function output, or how how can you do such modification to let the output graph move like you uh, as 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 what you want. So I am here at desmos.com, which is an online graphing calculator. And the goal of this video is to explore how shifts in functions happen. How do things shift to the right or the left? Or how do they shift up and down? And what we're going to start off doing is just graph a plain vanilla function, f of x is equal to x squared. That looks as we would expect it to look. But now let's think about how we could shift it up or down. Well, one thought is, well, to shift it up, we just have to make the value of f of x higher. So we could add a value. And that does look like it shifted it up by one. Whatever f of x was before, we're now adding one to it. So it shifts the graph up by one. That's pretty intuitive. If we subtract one, or actually let's subtract three, notice it shifted it down. The vertex was right over here at zero, zero. Now it is at zero, negative three. So it shifted it down. And we can set up a slider here to make that a little bit clearer. So if I just replace this with, if I just replace this with the variable k, then let me delete this little thing here, that, that little subscript thing that happened. Then we can add a slider k here. And this is just allowing us to set what k is equal to. So here k is equal to one. So this is x squared plus one. And notice we have shifted up. And if we increase the value of k, notice how it shifts the graph up. And as we decrease the value of k, if k is zero, we're back where our vertex is right at the origin. And then as we decrease the value of k, it shifts our graph down. And that's pretty intuitive because we're adding or subtracting that amount to x squared. So it changes, we could say the y value, it shifts it up or down. But how do we shift to the left or to the right? So what's interesting here is to shift to the left or to the right, we can replace our x with an x minus something. So let's see how that might work. So I'm going to replace our x with an x minus, let's replace it with an x minus one. What do you think is going to happen? Do you think that's going to shift it one to the right or one to the left? So let's just put the one in. Well, that's interesting. Before our vertex was at zero, zero. Now our vertex is at one, zero. So by replacing our x with an x minus one, we actually shifted one to the right. Now, why does that make sense? Well, one way to think about it, before we put this x, before we replaced our x with an x minus one, the vertex was when we were squaring zero. Now, in order to square zero, squaring zero happens when x is equal to one. When x is equal to one, you do one minus one, you get zero, and then that's when you are squaring zero. So it makes sense that you have a similar behavior of the graph at the vertex now when x equals one as before you had when x equals zero. And to see how this can be generalized, let's put another variable here and let's add a slider for h. And then we can see that when h is zero and k is zero, our function is really then just x squared. And then if h increases, we are, we're replacing our x with x minus a larger value that's shifting to the right. And then as, as h, decreases as it becomes negative, that shifts to the left. Now right here, h is equal to negative five. You typically won't see x minus negative five. You would see that written as x plus five. So if you replace your x's with an x plus five, that actually shifts everything five units to the left. And of course we can shift both of them together like this. So here we're shifting it up and then we are, we could get back to our neutral horizontal shift and then we can shift it to the right like that. And everything we did just now is with uh, the x squared function as our core function, but you could do it with all sorts of functions. You could do it with an absolute value function. Let's do it, let's do absolute value. That's always a fun one. Instead of squaring all this business, let's have an absolute value here. So I'm gonna put an absolute, whoops, absolute value. And there you have it. You can start at, let me make both of these variables equal to zero. So that would just be the graph of f of x is equal to the absolute value of x. But let's say you wanted to shift it so that this point, right? over here that's at the origin is at the point negative five, negative five, which is right over there. So what you would do is you would replace your x with x plus five, or you would make this h variable to negative five right over here. Because notice, if you replace your h with a negative five, in the, inside the absolute value, you would have an x plus five. And then if you want to shift it down, you just reduce the value of k. And if you want to shift it down by five, you reduce it by five, and you could get something like that. So I encourage you go to desmos.com, try this out for yourself, and really play around with these 
these functions to give you to give yourself an intuition of how things and why things shift up or down when you add a constant and why things shift to the left or the right when you replace your x's with an x minus in this case an x minus h but it really could be x minus some type of a constant and i got it so why the Kohen Academy um, wanted to add their own video player in their website. Well, that's simply because if you live in China or any unopened country, then you won't be able to visit the, you won't be able to visit the YouTube. If you cannot visit the YouTube website, then you won't be able to see the video. But once the Khan Academy put their own video player here, now you could be able to see their uh, tutorial, mass tutorial without uh, using a VPN. I don't know if it's, a, if it's a good thing or not. If you say it is good, then that must mean, well, it has, it gives a a lot of benefits to those people live in an unopened country, for example, in China. But if you say it is bad, then it will be you are adopting those unfair rules. Okay, you you are leo down in front of the evil rules. Okay, that's a shift. So basically, in shifts, if you have a horizontal and you, if you get a function like this, when the y minus something or the output minus something, this graph will go go down. But if you add something to your output, then your orange graph would be go up. That's the output or the y, the variable y. Then it comes to the x. Well, that's a little bit tricky. I cannot explain it in this with this toe, but I could do it with something else. All right, let's say if now you got a horizontal line, you got the, so you got the x axis, you got the y axis, and you have a function like this. When you minus the x, what would happen? For example, if that, if that at the beginning, the whole expression here equal to two, now you minus two. And we will make sure that they are equal. How can we make sure they are equal? Well, we, we, we just have to say the x must plus 1 here. This, this value must be x plus 1. If the x need, need to be added by 1, then at the beginning, if the x is 0, after the minus 2, now the x is in here. So that's why the whole graph moves to the right. I know this is a little bit tricky, but let me do it with a y. So at the beginning, if the y, if the y equal to one, when we move it up, y plus one, and we want to make sure the two stuff represents the same thing, then what we should do to keep it uh, in there? Will the y need to be minus by one? No, no, no. <sighs> This is really complex. To be honest, I, I, I sometimes also do not know why we minus one, the whole graph would go right. And when we plus one, the whole graph would go uh, left. And also, I don't know why, why we, uh, oh, oh, of course, I know this, this one. When we plus one to the y, the whole stuff go up a little bit. That's okay. Why minus one, the whole graph go down for a little bit. That's something very straightforward. But for the x, it's in the context not so straightforward. Come on guys, I really doubt uh, I really doubt about everything that we have learned so so far. So um I just want to graph it out. For example, now if we got an expression called x equal to y and what's the graph of it? So when we set the x equal to 1, when the x equal to 1 what would be the, the value of y? Well, the y should be also equal to 1. So in this case, we can draw a point here. Uh, then, if it's equal to 2, we could draw another point right here. So in the end, if we connect all those points together, we would get a straight line like this. Oh, this point should be on line. Um, all right, then after that, let me say, when, when I change the whole expression into x plus 1 equal to y, what would happen? Well, if the, if the x equal to 1, then what's the y, what's the value of y? That would just be 2. Okay, so when the x equal to y, the y value equal to 2, which is y in here. And then when the x equal to 2, what's the value of y? What is the, the value of y would be? Well, it's just simply equal to 2 plus 1, which is 3, right? So when x is 2, 
will get the y value at the 3. Okay, so in this case, if you connect the two points together and you, you somehow draw a line, straightforward line, you'll get something like this. So uh, let's say this is our first line, this is our second line, which represents uh, two different expressions. And when you see the x here, what do you say? You say, when I add the x by one, the whole graph just moves up for one. So do you know what I mean? What I mean is the, the, the whole stuff, the, the Kohan tell you, somehow the shifting functions, they are not exactly right. It depends on your expression. If your expression looks just like this one, the whole, uh, row or um, definitions he gave to you is wrong. So um, it, it really depends on the expression that you are working on. So I guess that's why I always couldn't understand then uh, because sometimes they, they, they didn't make it right. All right, let's get into another function sorry, another concept, reflecting functions. So what you see here, this is a screenshot of the Desmos online graphing calculator. You can use it at desmos.com and I encourage you to use this after this video or even while I'm doing this video. But the goal here is to think about reflection of functions. So let's just start with some examples. Let's say that I had a function f of x and it is equal to the square root of x. So that's what it looks like, fairly reasonable. Now let's make another function, g of x, and I'll start off by also making that the square root of x. So no surprise there, g of x was graphed right on top of f of x. But what would happen if, instead of it just being the square root of x, what would happen if we put a negative out front right over there? What do you think is going to happen when I do that? Well, let's just try it out. When I put the negative, it looks like it flipped it over the x-axis. It looks like it reflected it over the x-axis. Now, instead of doing it that way, what if we had another function, h of x, and I'll start off by making it identical to f of x. So once again, it's right over there, it traces out f of x. Instead of putting the negative out in front of the radical sign, what if we put it under the radical sign? What if we replaced x with a negative x? What do you think is going to happen there? Well, let's try it out. If we replace it, that shifted it over the y-axis. And then pause this video and think about how would you shift it over both axes? Well, we could do a, well, I'm, I'm running out of letters. Maybe I will do a, I don't know, k of x is equal to, so I'm gonna put the negative outside the radical sign, and then I'm gonna take the square root, and I'm gonna put a negative inside the radical sign, and notice, it flipped it over both. It flipped it over both the x-axis and the y-axis to go over here. Now, why does this happen? Well, let's just start with the g of x. So when you put the negative out in front, when you negate everything that's in the expression that defines a function, whatever value you would have gotten the, of the function before, you're now going to get the opposite of it. So when x is zero, we got zero. When x is one, instead of one now, you're taking the negative of it, so you're gonna get negative one. When x is four, instead of getting positive two, you're now going to get negative two. When x is equal to nine, instead of getting positive three, you now get negative three. So hopefully that makes sense why putting a negative out front of an entire expression is going to flip it over, flip its graph over the x-axis. Now what about replacing an x with a negative x? Well, one way to think about it now is whatever, whenever you inputted one before, that would now be a negative one that you're trying to evaluate the principal root of. And we know that the principal root function is not defined for negative one. But when x is equal to negative one, our original function wasn't defined there when x is equal to negative one. But if you take the negative of that, well now you're taking the principal root of one. And so that's why it is now defined. So whatever value the function would have taken on at a given value of x, it now takes that value on the corresponding opposite value of x, and on the negative value of that x. And so that's why it flips it over the y-axis. And this is true with many types of functions. We don't have to do this just with a, a square root function. Let's try another function. Let's say we tried this for e to the x power. So there you go, we have a very classic exponential there. Now let's say that g of x is equal to negative e to the x, and if what we expect to happen happens, this will flip it over the x-axis. So negative e to the x power, and indeed that is what happens. And then how would we flip it over the y-axis? Well, let's do an h of x. That's going to be equal to e 
to the, instead of putting an X there, we will put a negative X, negative X. And there you have it. Notice it flipped it over the Y axis. Now both examples that I just did, these are very simple expressions. Let's imagine something that's a little bit more complex. Let's say that F of X, let's give it a nice higher degree polynomial. So let's say it's X to the third minus 2X squared. That's a nice one. And actually let's just add another term here. So plus 2X, oh no, I want to make it Make it minus 2x. I want to see, accentuate some of those curves. All right, so that's a pretty interesting graph. Now, how would I flip it over the x-axis? Well, the way that I would do that is I could define a g of x. I could do it two ways. I could say g of x is equal to the negative of f of x, and we get that. So that's essentially just taking this entire expression and multiplying it by negative one. And notice, it's multiplying it, it's flipping it over the x-axis. Another way we could have done it is, instead of that, we could have said the negative of x to the third minus minus 2x squared, and then minus 2x, and then we close those parentheses, and we get the same effect. Now what if we wanted to flip it over the y-axis? Well then instead of putting a negative on the entire expression, what we want to do is replace our x's with a negative x. So you could do it like this. You could say that that's going to be f of negative x. And that has the effect of everywhere you saw an x before, you replace it with a negative x. And notice, it did exactly what we expect. It flipped it over, over the y-axis. Now, the other way we could have done that, just to make it clear, that's the same thing as negative x to the third power minus two times negative x squared minus two times negative x. And of course, we could simplify that expression, but notice, it has the exact same idea. And if we- All right, um, this concept is also, is also quite uh, simple. So actually, you could, uh, let me just try it out. All right, so um, here we go. If you get an expression like you know, y equal to fx, if the graph of this function or of this, uh, yeah, I would call it a function. If the graph of this function is something like this, then if you add a negative sign on the entire output, which is negative fx, then your original graph would be flapped according uh, flap to. Oh, I, I don't know how to express this for sure, but it will flap to here. All right, then. Let's see, if now, uh, instead of putting the negative sign on the entire function, if I just wanna put the negative sign inside of the inside of every x value out there, something like this, then what the graph would be now? Well, it will flap over with the uh, y axis, something like that. This is a simple idea. Okay, uh, as you could say right now, this is an expression that we could use if you want to express the flap. So you could say, um, the original graph will flap it over the x-axis or the original graph will flap over the y-axis. The most important part is called flap over and over what? Which is the center stuff. Oh, okay. So I guess that's it. Let's go to another video. Symmetry of functions. What is that? You've likely heard the concept of even and odd numbers. And what we're going to do in this video is think about even and odd functions. And as you can see, or as you will see, there's a little bit of a parallel between the two, but there's also some differences. So let's first think about what an even function is. One way to think about an even function is that if you were to flip it over the y-axis, that the function looks the same. So here's a classic example of an even function. It would be this right over here, your classic parabola where your vertex is on the y-axis. This is an even function. So this one is maybe the graph of f of x is equal to x squared. And notice, if you were to flip it over the y-axis, you're going to get the exact same graph. Now a way that we can talk about that mathematically, and we've talked about this when we introduced the idea of reflection, to say that a function is equal to its reflection over the y-axis, that's just saying that f of x is equal to f of negative x. Because if you were to replace your x's with a negative x, that flips your function over the y-axis. Now, what about odd functions? So odd functions, you get the same function if you flip over the y and the x-axis. So let me draw a classic example of an odd function. 
our classic example would be f of x is equal to x to the third, is equal to x to the third, and it looks something like this. So notice, if you were to flip first over the y axis, you would get something that looks like this. So I'll do it as a dotted line. If you were to flip just over the y-axis, it would look like this. And then if you were to flip that over the x-axis, well then you're going to get the same function again. Now how would we write this down mathematically? Well, that means that our function is equivalent to not only flipping it over the y-axis, which would be f of negative x, but then flipping that over the x-axis, which is just taking the negative of that. So this is doing two flips. So some of you might be noticing a pattern or think you might be on the verge of seeing a pattern that connects the words even and odd with the notions that we know from earlier in our mathematical lives. I've just shown you an even function where the exponent is an even number. And I've just showed you an odd function where the exponent is an odd number. Now, I encourage you to try out many, many more polynomials and try out the exponents, but it turns out that if you just have f of x is equal to, if you just have f of x is equal to x to the n, then this is going to be an even function if n is even, and it's going to be an odd function if n is odd. All right, um, actually this concept is also quite, uh, let's say, important in the exam of China, uh, because sometimes they, they will really um, has to you about those concepts, the, the even or the odd concepts. Um, okay, so let me let me just write it down. So if you get a so if you get a even function, what does that mean? That means your f x would just be equal to f negative x. So uh, whenever you put a negative x into it, it will just take it as as the x. All right. Then what's the odd function? All the function it's quite different. So uh, whenever you put a negative sign into your x variable, you always get the whole output negative, which is negative fx. The f I am writing here, the full length for it is function. So don't so don't make me wrong. I guess this is more important for you to understand than the character f. Because sometimes in China, those stupid teachers they would they would never tell you that the f represents the the function. So you will always get confused. What the fuck of the f it is? And you will never understand math, mathematics and, and you will always hate it because you don't understand it. Okay, so let's get into the next video. Scaling functions. Well, that's, that's quite interesting. How can you scale a function? So this is a screenshot of Desmos. It's an online graphing calculator. And what we're going to do is use it to understand how we can go about scaling functions. And I encourage you to go to Desmos and try it on your own, either during this video or after. So let's start with a nice, interesting function. Let's say f of x is equal to the absolute value of x. So that's pretty straightforward. Now let's try to create a scaled version of f of x. So we could say g of x is equal to, well, I'll start with just absolute value of x. So it's the same as f of x. So it just traced g of x right on top of f. But now let's multiply it by some constant. Let's multiply it by two. So notice the difference between g of x and f of x. And you can see that g of x is just two times f of x. In fact, we can write it this way. We can write g of x is equal to two times f of x, we get to the exact same place. But you can see that as, as our x increases, g of x increases twice as fast, at least for positive x's, on the right hand side. And actually as x decreases, g of x also increases twice as fast. So is that just a coincidence that we have a two here and it, and it increased twice as fast? Well, let's put a three here. Well, now it looks like it's increasing three times as fast. And it does that in both directions. Now, what if we were to put a 0 0.5 here? 0 0.5. Well, now it looks like it's increasing half as fast. And that makes sense because we are just multiplying, we are scaling how much our f of x is. So before, when x equals one, we got to one. But now when x equals one, we only get to one half. Before when x equals five, we got to five. Now when we get to x equals five, we only get to 2.5. So we're increasing half as fast, or we have half the slope. Now an interesting question to think about is, what would happen if instead of it just being an absolute value of x, let's say we were to have a non-zero y-intercept. So let's say, I don't know, plus six. 
So notice, then when we change this constant out front, it not only changes the slope, but it changes the y-intercept because we're multiplying this entire expression by 0.5. So if you multiply it by one, we're back to where we got before. And now if we multiply it by two, this should increase the y-intercept because remember, we're multiplying both of these terms by two. And we see that. It not only doubles the slope, but it also increases the y-intercept. If we go to 0.5, not only did it decrease the slope by a factor of one half, or, or I guess you could say multiply the slope by one half, but it also made our y-intercept be half of what it was before. And we can see this more generally if we just put a general constant here and we can add a slider. And actually, let me make the constant go from zero to 10 with a step of, I don't know, 0.05. That's just how much does it increase every time you change the slider. And notice, when we increase our constant, not only we're we getting narrower, because the slope, the magnitude of the slope is being scaled, but our y-intercept increases. And then as k decreases, our y-intercept is being scaled down, and our slope is being scaled down. Now that's one way that we could go about scaling, but what if instead of multiplying our entire function by some constant, we instead just replace the x with a constant times x. So instead of k times f of x, what if we did f of k times x? Another way to think about it is g of x is now equal to the absolute value of kx plus six. What do you think is going to happen? Pause this video and think about it. Well, now when we increase k, notice it has no impact on our y-intercept because it's not scaling the y-intercept, but it does have an impact on slope. When k goes from one to two, once again, we are now increasing twice as fast. And then when k goes from one to one half, we're now increasing half as fast. Now this is with an absolute value function. What if we did it with a different type of function? Let's say we did it with a quadratic. So two minus x squared. And let me scroll down a little bit. And so you can see when k equals one, these are the same. And now if we increase our k, let's say we increase our k to two, notice our parabola is, our, in this case, decreasing as we get further and further from zero at a faster and faster rate. That's because what you would have seen at x equals two, you're now seeing at x equals one because you are multiplying two times that. And so, and if we, in, and then if we go between zero and one, notice on either side of zero, our parabola is decreasing at a lower rate. It's a changing rate, but it's a, a lower changing rate, I guess you could put it that way. So uh, when I see the whole pictures of this video, I start wondering also, sorry, I, I start to think that this is probably why the American education is so successful, because they always like to, you know, show you the simplest way or the straightforward way, the intuitive way um, to you. They, 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 they will always, you know, give you the best. So when he change those parameters like the key or X, whatever, the, the whole graph gets changed currently. So it's very straightforward and an intu intuition. Uh, it, it's an intuition way for all of us to understand the, the, the concepts of what he was talking about. But uh, in some poor country or in some other country, they do not do that. You know, they, they do all those stuff with, with their bare hand. Uh, it's kind of stupid. It, it will never be as good as the, the computer, you know. And I guess that's it. Uh, back into the mathematical class in a traditional way, um, those teachers who love to draw graphs would be more welcomed than those teachers who, who don't. Okay, let's get into the next one. Identifying function transformations. We, we're gonna put it, all of those stuff together. So this red curve is the graph of f of x, and this blue curve is the graph of g of x. And I want to try to express g of x in terms of f of x. And so let's see how they're related. So we pick any x, and we could start right here at the vertex of f of x. And we see that at least at that point, g of x is exactly one higher than that. So g of two, I could write this down. g of two, g of two is equal to, is equal to f of two, f of two plus one plus one. Let's see if that's true for any x. So then we can just sample over here. Well, let's see, g of, let's see, f of four is right over here. g of four is one more than that. G, f, of, f of six is right here. g of six is one more than that. 
So it looks like if we pick any point over here, even though there's a little bit of an optical illusion, it looks like they get closer together. They do if you look, try to find the closest distance between the two. But if you look at vertical distance, you see that it stays a constant, it stays a constant one. So we can actually generalize this. This is true for any x. g of x is equal to f of x is equal to f of x plus one. Let's do a few more examples of this. So right over here, here is f of x in red again. And here is g of x. And so let's say we picked x equals negative four. This is f of negative four. And we, say, we see g of negative four is two less than that. And we see whatever f of x is, g of x, no matter, where we, no matter what x we pick, g of x seems to be exactly two less. g of x is exactly, exactly two less. So in this case, very similar to the other one, g of x is going to be equal to f of x, but instead of adding, we're going to subtract two from f of x, f of x minus two. Let's do a few more examples. So here we have f of x in red again. I'll relabel it, f of x. And here is g of x, here is g of x. So let's think about it a little bit. Let's pick, a, let's pick an arbitrary point here. Let's say we have in red here, this is this point right over there, is the value of f of three. So that, or f of negative three, I should say. This is negative three. This is the point negative three f of three. So negative three f of three. Now g hits that same value when x is equal to negative one. When x is equal to negative one. So let's think about this. g, g of negative one, is equal to f of negative three. f of negative three is equal to f of negative three. And we could do that with a bunch of points. We could see that g of, g of zero, g of zero, which is right there. Let me do it in a color you can see. g of zero is equivalent, is equivalent to f of negative two. So let me write that down. g of zero is equal to f of negative two. We could keep doing that. We could say g of one. g of one, g of one, which is right over here, this is one, g of one is equal to f of negative one. g of one is equal to f of negative one. So I think you see the pattern here. g of whatever is equal to f of is equal to the, the function evaluated at two less than whatever is here. So we could say, we could say that g of x is equal to f of, well it's gonna be two less than x. So f of x minus two. So this is the relationship. g of x is equal to f of x minus two. It's important to realize here, when I did f of x minus two here, and remember, I'm taking, I'm taking, the function is being evaluated, this, this is the input, x minus two is the input. When I subtract the two, this is shifting the function to the right, which is a little bit counterintuitive unless you go through this exercise right over here. So g of x is equal to f of x minus two. If it was f of x plus two, we would have actually shifted f to the left. Now let's think about this one. This one is, seems kind of wacky. So first of all, g of x, it's, it, it almost looks like a mirror image, but it looks like it's been flattened out. So let's think of it this way. Let's take the mirror image of what g of x is. So I'm gonna try my best to take the mirror image of it. So let's see, it gets to about two there, then it gets pretty close to one right over there, and then it gets to about right over there. So if I were to take its mirror image, it looks something, it looks something like this. It's a mirror image if I were to reflect it across the across the x-axis. It looks something like this. It looks something like this. So this right over here, this right over here we would call, so if this is negative, if this is g of x, if this is g of x, when we flip it that way, this is the negative g of x. Negative g of x. When x equals four, g of x looks like it's, I don't know, about negative three and a half. You take the negative of that, you get positive. I guess it should be closer to, you get positive three and a half if you were to take the exact mirror image. So that's negative g of x, but that still doesn't get us there. It looks like we actually have to triple 
this value for any point. And you see it here. This, this gets to two, but we need to get to six. This gets to one, but we need to get to three. So it looks like this red graph right over here is three times this graph. So this is three times negative g of x, which is equal to negative three g of x. So here we have f of x is equal to negative three times g of x. And if we wanted to solve for g of x, write g of x in terms of f of x, we would write, dividing both sides by negative three, g of x is equal to negative one-third f of x. Negative one-third f of x. Uh, so, uh, as we have done all of that uh, stuff, but just one thing to mention, you know, as before, before we have learned about the geometry, I guess, we, ha we have learned about those concepts about, uh, you know, reflection, marrow, rotation, um, kind of things, or, or, or the transformation, for example, move an object up, down, left, or right. Um, that's the concept of geometry stuff. But for this, this, this unite, it's, it's, it's the same idea, but uh, with the functions. Um, but anyway, in the end, they will be exactly the same. For example, now if you have a triangle, you want to move it down. How do you do that? If you get all of your points and, and you, if you can represent your triangle with a function fx, you want to move this triangle down. How can you do that? For example, you, you could just uh, say this fx minus a, a lambda, whatever lambda you, you like, and you get the transformed new triangle. So they, somehow they are related uh, later. If you know how to represent your triangle with a, with a matrix or, or a pure function, you could do that kind of thing. And also, uh, let's say if you want to scale your triangle, uh, let's say two times bigger than before, how can you do that? Well, you just have to modify your function by two, and that's it. You'll get a quite bigger triangle. All right, so what's left here is for you guys to find out the graph of ex exponential function and uh, logarithmic function. I guess I was reading it correct. Uh, let, let me let me say logarithmic functions. Logarithmic functions. Okay, so yeah, let's have a look at it. I was kind of forget forgot about all those uh, different kind of functions. You know, you know, in the end, when you uh, when you have to process those uh, uh, problems that are related to those uh, different functions, it's especially for the properties, you will often draw a graph, then do your analyzation based on that graph. We're told the graph of y equals two to the x is shown below, all right? Which of the following is the graph of y equals two to the negative x minus five? So there's two changes here. Instead of two to the x, we have two to the negative x. And then we're not leaving that alone, we then subtract five. So let's take them step by step. So let's first think about what y. All right, here I got a very bad network connection in in inside of China. So, um, but as as far as I say, the whole video is still talking about the transformation of a function. But but for now, the different part is the function has changed. It, it's changed from some simple stuff to a exponential one like this one. No, so the the the, the core idea it is the same. So I guess that's uh, all for today's mathematics learning and I hope you have learned something from this. Okay, that's it. I will see you guys in the next video. Bye!